Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first Gavelli School Centennial Speaker Series webinar of the 2021-2022 academic year. Thank you for joining us for today's event, featuring Thomas Petrofi in conversation with Bob Pisani. My name is Srish Chatterjee, Professor of Finance and Business Economics at the Gabelli School and Gabelli Chair in Global Security Analysis. And it's my pleasure to be here as our series returns. This event series began in 2020, marking 100 years of purpose-driven business education at Fordham. In the last year, the Gabelli Center for Global Security Analysis and our wonderful partners, the Museum of American Finance and CFA Society in New York have sponsored 30 events that drew an audience of nearly 5,000 attendees. We are tremendously proud of this dynamic partnership and grateful to you for joining us today. At the Gabelli School, a network of industry partners and global thought leaders empowers our community with the vision and values to use business as a catalyst for change. As guests, you are an important part of that work. Please enjoy our brand new lineup this year and help us share the word by inviting others in your network. Today's session features Thomas Petafi, chairman and founder of Interactive Brokers Group Incorporated and CNBC senior markets correspondent, Bob Pisani, a familiar face to our series. Together, they will discuss Thomas's work leading up to creating Inter Interactive Brokers Group, which today is the second largest publicly traded electronic broker. In a moment, I will hand this off to David Cowan, President and CEO of the Museum of American Finance. Following today's discussion, David and Bob will facilitate audience questions, which we should ask that you type into the Q&A section near the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our speakers will be addressing uh, as many of them as possible. So without uh, further ado, I turn it over to David. Thanks, Suresh. Great to be back with you, our friends at Fordham and the CFA Society. Uh, Thomas is the embodiment of the American dream, an immigrant who comes to this country with little means, no command of the English language, and through talent, perspiration, and vision, creates an incredible company. Born in the midst of World War II in Hungary, Thomas emigrated here in 1965 and was an early adopter of computers for an engineering firm that he was working at. He wrote code and then in 1977 bought a seat on the Amex to trade options, becoming the first to use computer-generated daily valuation sheets. A constant force for automation to replace inefficient manual systems, Thomas created the predecessor to interactive brokers with four employees, and the rest is history. It currently employs 2,400 people in excess of 10 billion in equity capital and conducts business in 135 markets. As anyone who has used the IB, like me, knows it is continually held as the best discount brokerage platform by places like Barron's for its elegance and ease of use. Thomas stepped down as CEO of IB in 2019, but he remains as the board chair and the majority shareholder. He can often be seen on CNBC, and today, as mentioned, we'll be joined by Bob Pisani, Senior Markets Correspondent for CNBC, where he has been since 1990. Uh, Bob is a great friend of this museum, doing events like today, assisting us by uh, contributing to our magazine, and thanks again as he was our 2021 uh, Gala MC. It's my pleasure now to turn it over to Bob in conversation with Thomas Pettifer. Thank you, David, uh, and thank you, Sri. Um, I've been associated with the Museum of American Finance for many years and proud to be a member and a, a contributor. And uh, I, I'm a contributor because I believe in the value of knowing the history of 
profession and the business that you're in, you might say, of course, well, that's obvious, but unfortunately it's not. There's an old joke in the trading community, uh, you know, uh, the, the runners uh, have a long memory, but uh, the race is short, uh, or <laughs> actually it's a long race, but the runners have a short memory. That's what the saying is. And too many runners in this game don't have a long enough memory, don't understand history. Uh, and how we got here, particularly the history of trading. It's amazing uh, what has happened in 20 years. I've been on the floor since 1997. Uh, and as I got here in the summer of 1997, the world was changing dramatically and it had been changing in the decade before. The man we're gonna talk to today was very instrumental in some of those changes that have been made. Uh, and this is why the Museum of American Finance exists, uh, to commemorate, to take note of uh, these changes and discuss what's going on with the future as well. So Thomas Petterby joins us now, and uh, I have known Tom for many years. He's been a source of great wisdom, and more importantly, he's been a man who's been accessible. When I need to get some details or information on some aspect of trading, he's one of the great experts. Uh, he's not just the guy who sits up there in an ivory tower. He very much knows about the details of how the markets uh, are, are put together. So Thomas, uh, it's a, a great honor to be sitting down um, with you again. And I'm wondering, um, what I want to do here is spend the first 15 or 20 minutes just talking about your career uh, and how you got here, because I don't know if everybody knows that, even though David had a great little introduction there. Uh, then maybe move forward to the present and get your thoughts on what's going on today. And I'll keep an eye on the questions here and pay attention to that. So, it, it, Thomas, why don't you sort of walk me through your, your, your early parts of your career? You emigrated from Hungary to the United States in 1965. Why exactly did you come here and how did you enter the trading business? So obviously, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. And uh, I, yes, I, I came in 1965 at, uh, from Hungary without basically anything. Uh, I got a job as a draftsman of the, of the highway designing firm and I bought a computer. And in those days, you know, every, it was very cool to own a computer, but they found out that nobody knew how to program. And then I volunteered to learn how to program it. And that's how I became a computer programmer. And then I moved on from there to a, to a consulting firm uh, that was writing computer programs for Wall Street applications. And one of our um, um, uh, clients was a precious metals trading firm. And uh, was called Mokata. I don't know if anybody remembers that name, but at any rate, uh, my job there was to build a computer department. But one day my boss came to me and said, you know, people are trading options. They call them puts and calls. And he explained to me what they were. And he said, but nobody knows how to value them. Uh, he said, if, if you could figure out a way to value them, maybe you could make some money here. And uh, so I thought about it for a long time and I started to write programs with simulation and, and looking at distribution functions and eventually came up with a formula that was very close to what is today known as Black Shores. So after a while, I went to the American Stock Exchange when after they started trading options given that I had my formula and I knew how to use it, by, by that time, Black Scholes was out there, but nobody really, the traders didn't know what to do with the formula, right? So I knew how to program the computer to give me fair values. So I printed out the fair values for puts and calls every uh, morning before I went down to the floor and I had fair values and nobody else had them. And that was a fantastic advantage for me. So um, around 82, uh, we, I started to really build up the, the uh, company. By that time, we had a way to, to uh, get the quotron prices into our computers and continuously look for option spreads that were out of back. And uh, that's where that's what we did at that time and it was very profitable and then but one day especially said you guys can just come in here and, and trade these spreads you have to make a market 
And I said, my God, how am I going to do that? I, I, my people don't know how to do that. And then I thought about it and I built this handheld computer. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have the first version with me, but I do have the second. And this is the handheld computer that we used on the floor of the exchange. I, I hope everybody can see. It. So this has a, 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 a touch screen and we printed out the, the you know, the, the uh, values for puts and calls, and you could put, put them in uh, via the, the touch. And uh, so uh, that worked for a while, but then we realized that, that we really had to have all of our trades in the computer in order to be able to, to run a hash portfolio. Uh, and the way we did that is that we asked the exchanges to please allow us to put computer screen, basically television screens on the floor that we drove from, my, from our offices in the World Trade Center via these telephone lines. And then we put those stacks of computer screens or TV screens on the floors and then we suddenly realized that there was a big problem because the traders couldn't see them from the trading crowd, couldn't see the number. Because on the numbers, we of course displayed our bids and offers for all the options. And then we realized that what we had to do was to substitute colored blocks for each digit. And that's what we displayed on the computer screens. And these screens were some psychedelic visions because those colored blocks continuously changed and we were always up to date. And, and then eventually we started to, to feed it with the futures price from the S&P leading contract, which always led, the, led all the prices. So we always were a little bit ahead of the market. And, uh, but, by that time, we, our, our system was were good enough to have a completely automated system. But of course, in the US, the, the uh, floor members didn't want automation to, to take the place of open outcry because they felt that, that their time and place advantage was the way they made their money. So, uh, but in, in 1990, in, in Europe and in Asia, electronic exchanges, options exchanges uh, started. And there we were able to go in and say, promise that if we maintain a continuous streaming market for all of these options, you are allowing us to interconnect our computer back in the United States to your computer in, in, in Frankfurt or Paris or, or Madrid or, or uh, Hong Kong. And uh, so we developed this worldwide system that, that where we drove all the prices automatically. And in the US, we still had uh, now by this time, uh, radio connected handheld computers. And we had a, 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 around 2000, we had over 200 exchange members in the United States and uh, a lot of, we were connected at roughly 15 exchanges outside of the United States that didn't need any uh, human labor. So uh, uh, that's how we realized that in 93, that given all this electronic network uh, to all the exchanges around the world, we could attach uh, uh, order, uh, we, we could attach uh, customer orders to our network. So if we develop a, a, a computerized uh, GUI for, for our um, customers, uh, and we incorporated interactive brokers to, to give this GUI to customers so that they could send us orders. We would show them the same uh, prices that our floor brokers saw on the screen. 
and I could that way inter interact with the marketplace and other traders. That's how it became known as interactive brokers. So that's how we got to 93. That is a, a, a very uh, a wonderful little summary. I just want to backtrack a little and just, there was a lot that was to digest there and just sort of summarize what, what you did because I want people to understand how important you were here. So what I hear here is about 1977, you had a seat on the Amex, um, you started trading equity options, but your key contribution was you were one of the first to apply a, a, a computerized mathematical model, the Black-Scholes model, uh, a, a, in, a, in a computer that would continuously offer bids and and uh, and price uh, bid and offer prices. That's a contribution. Uh, and then a few years later, I think it was 82, 83, you held up that tablet computer, uh, and you were among the very first to run an automated trading system for equity options, and and that tablet computer was for use by your employees on, on the trading floor. And I hope you'll hold on to that and consider donating that to the museum sometime, <laughs> because I think it, uh, I'm sure Dave would like to have that. Um, and, and then uh, you were a little vague on the timeline, but somewhere in the mid eighties, you employed a, 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 a fully integrated, I don't know what you call it, automated market system for stocks and options and futures. Uh, and then you eventually extended that around the, goal, the globe. Um, I just want to go back to being on the floor. It's, you know, 1980, and you're doing this on the floor at the Amex, um, this continuous streaming market you were describing. H how did the traders react to that? Um, they're guys on the floor. You know, a few so, years so, before, they couldn't even figure out how to price an option. And right, not, so, not only are you pricing options more efficiently, you're doing it electronically. What was, how did they treat So, so it was interesting, and that's, in a way, that's the difference between New York and Chicago. In New York, they thought, well, it was kind of strange, but it was okay. Why not? In Chicago, we were not allowed. In Chicago, we were fined. They passed the rule that no, no analytical devices are allowed in the trading crowd. They actually made that rule. And in New York, they just complained about the first a handheld being very sharp edge. That's why we changed it to this. You see the edges are very round here. <laughs> so uh, in New York and Chicago were very different from that point of view. But, but the fact is that, that it, is the, it is really that, that all over the world, they already had these automated exchanges in, in the in 1990s. And in the, fir the first electronic exchange in the US, the first electronic options exchange was, uh, was the ISC, which was introduced in the year 2000. And, and it's interesting to note that that was not an, an old fashioned exchange that converted to electronic, but it had to be a completely new exchange. So it didn't have an estranged, uh, people who were, who were uh, making their living out, out of trading the old fashioned way. Yep. And so, so that was an important uh, issue. And it was Bill Brodsky who went to Chicago from the Amex and eventually became the, the chairman of the CBOE who basically was successful to talk these folks into converting to electronic. Uh, markets. Yeah, I remember the uh, International Securities Exchange, as I, I recall, it came out of the NYSE. Uh, David Krell was down here. That's right, time. David Krell, yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I remember him quite well. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think we've gone over your importance here in terms of developing electronic markets for, for options. I want to get up to the point, you stopped where Interactive Brokers was created. Now that was uh, 1993, right? Interactive That's right. Started. Yeah. So let's pick it up right Right there, Interactive Brokers is formed in '93. The, the the job here is, you know, you're, you're linking up with the electronic exchanges starting up around the world. Um, we are seeing a lot of changes uh, uh, now. Um, electronification is is really picking up. Uh, you have uh, early electronic communication networks um, uh, like Instanet is around uh, at the time. 
Uh, NASDAQ is starting to get some very serious competition um, from these, uh, uh, these electronic uh, networks. Uh, the NYSE, not so much yet, but getting a little uh, concerned about that. Describe what trading was like in the mid 1990s, because that's when I got there. I got on the floor in 97. And in 1997, the, NY the NASDAQ was panicked about the growth of electronic communication networks. Uh, Archipelago had, had come in. Uh, uh, there were SOS bandits around like Daytech and Harvey Houtkin. There's a name I bet you haven't heard right. of all time. <laughs> uh, from All Trade, was it? I forget. I think Harvey. All right. Was yeah, All Trade. Trade. Yeah. yeah. Quite a character. Yeah. <laughs> uh, R.I.P. Uh, Harvey Houtkin. Uh, yeah. And uh, describe what it was like to be in, in that particular environment, because that's when the world the world dramatically changed. About well, well, because it was incredibly frustrating because. You know, it, it was so incredibly efficient uh, all over the world, except in the United States. That, that was just something that, that really we had to do something about because, you know, we, we were, it was so easy to get a trade done in Japan or in Hong Kong or in, or in Mumbai or, or in Australia or, or uh, you know, in, in anywhere in Europe or even in, in Canada, by that time, we had electronic exchanges. And in, in the US was a very, very, I mean, the specialists were a very powerful force that, that didn't want to move. They just didn't want to move. And uh, so eventually, actually, the New York began to slowly get their feet wet and accepted um, what was it called? The, the electronic order routing system. Uh, they, 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 they allowed that and we had- a, The order uh, handling a, rules. Oh, oh yeah. Order yeah. handling rules. So, yeah. so we had some small market making uh, systems there and that was very profitable and the specialists didn't like it. So, well, the fact is that, you know, the specialist system basically uh, went out of business with the open outcry leaving, right? Yeah. Because, you know, then the, the uh, likes of Citadel and uh, uh, these folks took over. So what happened was that we were, we were probably the largest, in Timber Hill it was called, our market making company. And it was the largest market making company up until 2009. And in 2009, after the crash, uh, Citadel and a number of other firms started to buy this order. And we had this conflict because we were a market maker. At the same time, we had interactive brokers, the broker. And we didn't know how to deal with this conflict of interest. We didn't want to. We didn't want to take the other side of interactive brokers, customers, trades. Uh, but that's what everybody else was doing. So we said, well, we have to do, we have to do one or the other. And, and we got rid of the market making entity and we just went with interactive brokers. And we still only sell about 3% of our order flow because we give our customers the choice. If they want zero commission, we'll sell their order flow. And if they are willing to pay a little bit of commission, then we are executing their orders at uh, the best price we can. Thomas, uh, welcome back. This is the second part of our discussion here. And then the first part, we went through your very important uh, history and your contributions uh, to the options business and to the trading business, leading right up to the um, creation of interactive brokers. I'd like to spend a few minutes on contemporary issues uh, and the, the whole business of managing uh, a firm like yours today. Uh, interactive brokers have been at the forefront of providing um, automation and low cost production uh, uh, as a, a low cost producer uh, in the business. Um, talk to me about the challenges of doing that today. Technology is still changing very, very fast. What's it take to stay on top and, and be in the forefront? What do you have to do to appeal to your uh, investors and appeal to the people who want to trade today? So I... In my opinion, uh, a company basically reflects the, the people who are running the company. And 
if you want a highly computerized automated firm, you have to make sure that the people who are running the company are basically software developers. And that's what we have always done, starting with myself, who was a software developer, all of the executives of the company they have always been software developers. So, and, and still are. So the CEO, uh, the current CEO came to work at Interactive Brokers as a graduate from with elect, electronic engineering degrees. And uh, so was everybody else. So we still feel that we are basically a technology company. And uh, so whenever we look at a new project uh, to that, to, that is always a, a software development project to us. That's, that's what we do. Yeah, so it, it, I marvel at the variety of traded products. I, I was looking at the, the list uh, again this morning, options, futures, Forex, bonds, uh, 135 trading venues, 27 currencies around the world. Um, I, you've been such a financial innovator over the decades. I'm wondering if there is something today that particularly excites you. Is there any new financial products on the horizon that, that you think are particularly interesting or, or innovative? Or is there something today um, that, you're, that, that you find interesting that's, that's moving that is an old product? I, I'm, I'm quite amazed at the explosion in the options business uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, but what excites you today? So a, a, a big global firm like us, uh, obviously the, the regulations are becoming an ever larger challenge. And uh, since we are active in so many different areas of the globe, each one has a different regulatory regime and being automated as we are, we continuously have to program all the regulations into our system so that our system doesn't only know the, the unique tax situation for every citizen of the world, depending upon where they reside and where their citizenship is. It's, it's, it, it, the, the, the number of combinations and the treaties between the different countries, the tax treaties, are just mind-bogglingly complex. And so that's what you have to cope with if you really want to be a, a global firm that can accept clients from anywhere in the world. And that's what we aim to be. So uh, what is a so so that is that is you know dealing with the regulations, developing software for them is is takes up much of our time. As far as new products, I mean, crypto is, a, is an extremely interesting brand new product. And we just introduced um, just seven days ago, trading in Bitcoin and Ethereum and Litecoin. And, uh, and we introduced that for, for US individuals. And then the issue is now to, to expand it to organizations and to expand it globally so that we are able to, to enable our customers in many, many different jurisdictions to, to participate in this. Tell me a little bit about, uh, and I know you, you have this, uh, you were just mentioning this, this new uh, cryptocurrency trading and uh, in relation with Paxos Trading Company, I remember that. Uh, very well, but g give us your thoughts on on Bitcoin in general. Are are I, I understand that your job is to provide the platform for people to trade, but I wonder what you, as a thought leader, um, feel about. I'm talking Bitcoin specifically, not not blockchain, but a, a cryptocurrency. All right. Like so blockchain. so uh, as as we see uh, deficit spending increasing in both in, in, in the United States and basically everywhere in the developed world. And it, in the developing world, it's always been a, a problem. Deficit spending is a, is a way of life. So uh, that 
leaves you with the with the thought that it is possible that uh, uh, paper currency will one day not be acceptable. I'm not saying that chances for that are high, chances for that are small, but it's just distinct possibility. So that's why I think that most people who can afford to should have a, a small percentage of their net worth invested in gold and in crypto. Now, maybe, maybe they will both become worthless and let's hope that that's, that's what's going to happen. But if the worst thing comes to become reality, then we will have to rely on gold and crypto. So that's my thinking. I have I have had uh, some of a small part of my net worth invested in that, and I hear many many people coming to me over, especially over the last year, asking me about uh, how should they invest be invested in crypto and how should how could they do it. So that's why we developed this. Yeah, it, I guess um, the, the, the logical retort to that would be, well, you can say that the development of fiat currency has created an inflation problem. This has been, you can see this with inflation since World War II uh, and going off the gold standard may have been contributing to that. And that goes back to 1933 when we went off the gold standard essentially um, for individuals. Um, the dollar is backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. What is Bitcoin backed with at this point? I mean, isn't that a logical question to ask? Well, well, well it's, it's, it's a logical question, but uh, you see, it is. It, you say that it's 1933. It's not 1933. Throughout entire human history, it's the economic and economic history of, 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 of the, the globe has always been about great empires uh, debasing their currency as they uh, uh, basically diminish in importance, right? It's always been the case uh, with the Greeks and the Romans, starting with them. So uh, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's a distinct possible, it, it, it always happens and, and it will happen again because you know, for politicians, the easiest thing is to spend and let the let the problem uh, leave the problem to the people who come after them, right? So that's that's always the case. So what is backing up Bitcoin? Bitcoin is what backs it up. Is it's the only thing that you cannot take make more of. It's it's you know there are just so many questions. Twenty one million, I believe. To, to the mathematical question that the Bitcoin basically is. There are a limited number of answers. When you mine the coin, you have to find one of the answers that has not been found yet. And there are less and less of those. So there, basically there is not a, there is a very limited supply. Now it has had a, a basically a, a decade long history. So it's becoming more and more accepted. And chances in my mind are very high that it will become a, an asset that people will look at as something that they need to have for for a long, long time to come. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. In, in that sense, it, it, there is some comparison uh, with Bitcoin and gold in that the supply is limited, uh, and that is one of its primary attractions. Let me move on to blockchain in, in general, which I think is a truly revolutionary idea. Um, Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency, you know, used on a blockchain. But I find that truly amazing. The, the idea that you could essentially answer the question, how do I know I own something, uh, has been an issue for centuries, for thousands of years. And uh, here in the United States, if you want to buy a stock, how do you know you own it? You have a clearing company that tells you. Uh, if you want to buy a piece of real estate, how do you know you own it? Uh, you get title insurance companies that tell you you own it. How, how do you know you sent $1,000 to your friend in London? You get JP Morgan that gets in the middle and confirms that they actually put $1,000 in your friend's account. So it seems to me like the disruptive nature of blockchain is that, that could 
could an, deal with all of those issues um, is, is quite remarkable. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? I've, I've obviously watched things like Ethereum that deals with smart contracts. Um, and to me, that's a very exciting technology that has very obvious applications. So, so I expect that blockchain will eventually permeate the entire uh, record keeping for, for people, right? So it's it's it will always be uh, it, it it is going to be adopted by more and more people and more and more organizations and and that will be the the way we will be keeping records in the future. Um, let me move on to uh, GameStop and Robinhood. Um, I did a story this morning. Uh, we're waiting for Gary Gensler, the chair of the SEC, to issue a report on what happened uh he has been promising this for months so we're waiting for it um uh, on gamestop on reddit on robin hood and sort of what happened there um or their interpretation um and uh he he's also brought up several market structure issues um that he'd like to address including gamification of trading uh, and payment for order flow and i know you have some opinions on that but let me let me just ask you um what your interpretation of the whole GameStop event was. Um, you, you messaged me before that actually it was a very serious matter. And I'm talking about the Robinhood situation where it came close to, I think you called it a systemic collapse. Uh, can you explain why you thought that was such a big, uh, a major issue? Okay, so, so I, first of all, I, I was unaware that the Gensler report came out today and I haven't read it and I, no, I'm, I'm sorry, Thomas. It didn't come out. Um, I did a, a re, I did a report on CNBC.com highlighting what was going on and um, did an interview with Larry Tab, who's a market structure expert, about what you might expect from payment for order flow. But the, oh, I see. the report is not out. No. Yeah. Okay. We're waiting. Okay. 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 So uh, I think that there is an extremely serious issue uh, within the regulations that that has surfaced in the GameStop matter. So what happened was that, as you know, the short interest was accumulating in GameStop. But uh, what people luckily did not know is the plumbing, the way Wall Street works. So what happens is that if you are uh, short, by the third day, the broker has to deliver you short uh, if, 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 if the loan calls for it, right? And if that, that doesn't happen, then the following day before the open, the broker has to go into the market and buy the stock. So now what happened here that the short interest exceeded all the shares outstanding and interestingly enough, the longs that were roughly 170% of all the flow uh, bought most of their longs in the 30, 40, $50 range per share. Now, as they asked for delivery, the, the short brokers had to go into the market and buy the stock, and in the next three days, the stock went up to three hundred and fifty dollars, right? Because the you know the brokers had no choice; they had to go in and buy the shares. What the what the speculators did, luckily enough, were unaware of, is that if they had just sold maybe 5% of their holdings, that would have wiped out the, the loan that they had against, the margin loan that they had against their position. And at the moment, a long, a long holding becomes fully paid, namely the margin loan is paid off, the broker immediately has to call the stock back. So a broker is not allowed to lend fully paid shares, uh, except for some very special circumstances when there is a specific agreement to that. So as soon as the, the 
longs would have taken some of their profits and their shares would have become fully paid because don't forget only those shares that are owned on margin is available to the brokers to lend out. So at the moment, the margin, uh, the, the margin loan is wiped out by selling some of the stock that had a very, very high profit on it from, from between, you know, bought it at $50, so say borrowed $25 on it. When he saw the uh, stock at $500, he would have repaid uh, um, all the margin loan outstanding with just save of a few shares, but the broker would have immediately had to call back all the shares. So that was the problem here. It's, it, it, so in the two days, it, it ran, up, ran up from $100 to $350. And it, had the people known that, the squeezers, had they known that this is how the plumbing works, they, they, the, the, the whole system would have collapsed because what do you do? So, so they, they sell the shares, just a few of them. So the brokers have to call back the shares, but there are no sellers. So, but, but they don't have a choice. They, they, must, they must buy at, at whatever price is available. So it could have gone to a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, five thousand, and eventually the brokers would have started to fail and the, uh, resulting in the clearinghouse failure also, because what happens when the clearinghouse takes over a failed broker's position, the clearinghouse by its rules is obligated to go into the market and cover the failing broker's position. So th there, is this, there is this unfortunate thing that this is how the regulations work. Fully paid shares are not allowed to be lent. So what, what would you suggest be done uh, about that? I mean, there's an obvious policy thing here, and I think Gensler will, will certainly address this, um, which is it's, it strikes the average person as a bit odd that you could have 170% of, of a shares out short, for example. Um, should there be something done about that? Should you not be allowed to do that? Should there be better disclosure about short positions <laughs> and systemically you were mentioning this problem how do you prevent that problem that you just described? So, so, so the problem is twofold one is that uh, we we publish short positions only twice a month uh, so the one thing should be done is that brokers should report the short positions every day and it should be continuously published two when the short position exceeds a certain amount the the regulator should call for higher margin requirements. So the problem is that no matter how, currently no matter how big the short position, the margin requirement is always 50%. But no, the margin requirement should be say the short position reaches, I don't know. So any, uh, in my mind, if, if, if a short position is over 10%, then every additional percent should require another percent of margin. So if the short position would went to go to 30%, the margin would be 70%. If it went to 50%, it would be 90%. If it would go to 100%, it would have to go to 140%. So they, 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 there wouldn't be enough money to make to accumulate such a sharp, large short position. And uh, just on a policy question, I just going back to this earlier, you can sort of, you could explain this to your mother and, and, and say, well, what happened was that there was 140% of the stock was short or 170%, whatever the actual number was. And, you know, you, you could explain this to your mother and it sounds a little odd. I mean, even somebody who doesn't know anything about the stock market would say, well, that sounds a little strange. How do you sell short 170% of the stock? How does that happen? And, and that's a good question. How does that happen and should it happen? I mean, should we not allow that to happen? So, so the way currently the rules work is if I'm a broker, if some customer comes to me and puts up a thousand dollars and wants to buy two thousand dollars worth of stock, I can lend him the other thousand 
buy the $2,000 worth of stock and immediately lend out that stock to the next buyer, right? So I can, I, I, I can lend whoever wants to borrow stock, I can, I can lend that stock out. So, uh, and, and, and so the, the next person comes, uh, uh, I get the money from him, I can, I can keep lending out the same stock when a short comes, right? So Wait, are you supposed uh, to be able to do that? I mean, this is one of the problems. People who keep saying to me, wait a minute, Bob, you have one share of this stock and here you have a locate on the stock and you're telling me like you keep shorting the same stock over and over again? That's right, that's right, that's well, right. Should that be allowed to happen? I'm, I keep pushing you to the policy question here. Well, the issue is that stocks are fungible. So you don't know <laughs> if this stock is a stock on which you have lent money and that one isn't. So. You know, since it's fungible, that's that's how it works out. But I, I don't think there's a problem there. I think the problem is that that the margin requirements are too low for for shorts. And if the margin requirements were increased, along with the short position increasing, then that would uh, okay. so stop you the problem. If now, the reason why this didn't come up before was that short squeezes are illegal. It's manipulation, it's not allowed, but there is a hole in the system to the extent that there are these social chat rooms where people just, just talk and, and it, you can't really point a finger at any one of them saying, well, you did it, you organized the short squeeze, you have to go to jail now, right? So we, we this didn't used to happen because we, we really cracked down very, very fast and hard on people who organized the short squeeze previously. But now we do not know anymore who is the organizer, right? So you, it, your point, if you're advising Gary Gensler and Gary Gensler is gonna make recommendations, you would say, don't make it um, illegal or find some way to stop more than 100% of the stock being sold short. Your position would be if you simply raise the margin requirements and continually publish short positions, that would deal with a good part of the problem. That's right. I think that would solve the problem. And, and just, you mentioned the chat rooms. Is it manipulation for a bunch of people to get together in a chat room and say, let's all, that, there definitely was a bunch of people got together in a chat room and said, let's all buy it and kill, up, kill the short sellers. That happened, right? Yeah, but so there wasn't really a hard and fast person, a hard and fast organization. Right, as it as it conventionally short squeezes was always. I said something to him, and he said this to him, and and we all agreed that we are not going to uh, give in, and we are going to hold our position, and uh, that that so that was illegal and manipulative. But there is, you know, with the, in these chat rooms, there is not a hard and fast agreement. So it's hard to really point the finger at anybody. Let me just move on to payment for order flow quickly. Um, I did an interview this morning with Larry Tab, uh, one of the great experts on market structure, because this is gonna come up. Gensler's gonna make some comments on, on payment for order flow. He's indicated he's concerned about it. He's concerned that there's not enough competition. He's concerned uh, uh, that too few people are in control. He's concerned about people may not be getting much, uh, if any, price improvement at all. Um, and I asked Larry Tab point blank, is the retail investor getting ripped off here? And he said, no. Um, I know you don't uh, uh, do any payment for order flow, um, but there are people who do. It, it, is, is the retail investor really being harmed by payment? Well, the retail investor is being harmed, but it's complicated as to how, because the fact is that the, uh, that the uh, internalizer, Citadel and Virtue, uh, does give uh, an execution that is very, very slightly better than the NBBO. And since they pay the order flow provider, the, the, those brokers do not have to charge commission. So it appears as though the retail uh, investor would be better off. But the fact is that if all that order flow would not be diverted from the exchange, but it went to the exchange, then that order flow would invite more liquidity providing orders at the exchange. 
and the NBBO would be much tighter than it is today relative to which the price improvement is provided. So what, they, what, what the rules today calls for is that each trade has to be take, has to take um, has to take place inside the NBBO. So as long as the you buy no better no no worse than the offer and sell no worse than the bid, then you you are okay based on the the the, the uh, broker did the did a good job. But the fact is that the NBBO is wider than it would be if if all the orders went to the exchange. Yeah. So that's the big difference. I think the debate I asked Larry about that exact question uh, is in 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 theory, most people, myself included, would like to see more trading on the lit exchanges. And it's an interesting academic question. We don't actually know what would happen if, for example, there was more trading on the lit exchange. If, so, so let's do a thought experiment of 100 percent. I asked Larry if 100 percent of trading was done on the lit exchanges, would everybody be getting, would retail investors be getting a better deal than they are now? And he said his answer was he would like to see more trading on the lit exchanges too. But while it's not clear if, in fact, the, the price improvement you're getting now would be as great if everything was on the lit exchanges. He agreed there would be some price improvement, but you know, if you're getting, say, you know, 60 cents per 100 shares, you know, price improvement, something like that, um, would you get the same amount if you went to a fully lit market? Maybe you'd only get 40 cents and the, broker, the, the dealers would keep another 20 cents. He's, he agrees it's an interesting question, but under the current regime, I have a hard time locating who is being harmed here? I mean, but you would agree, Thomas, you were involved in this in the beginning, that the average retail investor is getting a better deal than they've ever gotten. 30 years ago, I have the, the, the commission rates for the NYSE. It was one to 2% to do a trade. Uh, and absolutely. So, what it is so, today. Absolutely. So the harm is relative. The harm, the, 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 without uh, payment for order flow and internalization, the retail orders would get a execution at a better price. But the, 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 the price improvement would probably be much, much less or even zero. But, but when you're talking about improvement, you are talking about an improvement against a, a very exaggerated bid offer spread, a very wide bid offer spread. I'm saying that if all the orders went to the exchange, the bid offer spread would be much, much, much tighter. And therefore the executions would be better at the prevailing bid and offer without improvement than they are today with improvement. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Well, Thomas, I, uh, it, it has been a pleasure chatting with you. You've been a friend of mine for, for almost 20 years and uh, uh, I, I very much value your, your guidance, your friendship, your, your good friend on CNBC. And uh, like I said, the reason I wanted you on with the Museum of American Finance is I want people to have an historical record of the, the value of your contributions. And uh, the core of your importance was that decision to become a programmer so many decades ago. Uh, I don't know what little spark inside you made you want to be an innovator like that, but I can't imagine what it's like sitting on the floor of the Amex in 1975. They must have thought you were a space alien <laughs> to come down there with these crazy boxes that you were showing up with. Uh, but you turned out to uh, have changed the world. And uh, for that, you should be very, very proud uh, of your contributions. We have been talking with Thomas Petterfee, uh, a great legend in the business of trading and the founder of Interactive Brokers, who is still a, a thought leader. Thomas, thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to your future thoughts as we have new financial innovations. I'm sure you'll be at the forefront uh, of, of that. Thank everybody, you very much. Thank you very much, Bob. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. And everybody, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, at, I don't know if David wanted to say anything in closing at all or Shri, but I very much enjoyed the chat with Thomas. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, and thank you, Thomas. This was indeed a, 
an extremely enlightening, very good discussion into some things that are not easy to understand from the outside. And you have excellent uh, way of explaining some of the more complex and difficult things in the world of trading. I'll let David uh, say the final words on this, but thanks again. This was wonderful. Uh, from the museum, thank you so much, Thomas, for your insights and Bob, as always, for assisting us on this. Our next event is September 30th, where we're going to talk about where is cryptocurrency headed? And we've got the former controller of the currency and the former head of the CFTC, as well as several others, including uh, the co-founder of Paxos, uh, Chad Cascarella. So please join us next week, everybody. See you then.